afternoon, everyone. And um, it seems these days that every company is uh, a tech company or trying to remodel itself as a tech company and even logistics, which I wouldn't normally associate with tech. But um, my sort of guest interviewee, C uh, CEO of Maersk, According to him, the future of his company is tech, and he's trying to not just remodel Maersk, but also the logistics industry. Um, so that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, Vincent, good to talk. Can yep. you, for those people in the audience who aren't familiar with Maersk, what's your elevator pitch? Well, I think what we're, what we're really setting out to do is is connecting and simplifying the global supply chain. This is actually a, a, an incredibly important infrastructure for the world. All our way of life, everything that is on stage here or in, in the arena here, needs the global supply chain to just get there. Our way of life going to a supermarket needs supply chain to get there. And what we've seen uh, over the years, but especially during COVID, is how vulnerable, actually, and fragile that infrastructure is. And what we're trying to do is, is actually connect, simplify, digitize, make it more resilient, make it, make it more performant for our customers. Mm. And just to give people a sense of your industry, I mean, it was boom time during the pandemic. Now, tougher times, the sort of global downturn in, in trade. Your company has announced 10,000 job cuts. Um, why are you sort of still focusing on tech as the kind of the future. Yeah. I think, you know, logistics in, it has been and will continue to be a fairly cyclical industry. You know, we move a lot with the cycles. And, and uh, as you mentioned, COVID has been, we've been one of the industries that have incredibly boomed during COVID. And like any industries that had had this boom, there is a bit of a correction that comes mm -hmm. on the back end of it. Fundamentally, there is this short game, which is continuing to adapt to the cycle, and there is also the long game. And the long game is actually applying technology into making the global supply chain more resilient. It's, it's an incredibly fragmented uh, infrastructure that needs a lot of connectivity, needs a lot of resilience, and keeping that eye on the long game is really what is going to make us successful in the long run. You, have you worked out roughly at any one time in your shipping containers, trucks, whatever, how many goods, items you're carrying or you're tracking? Is it, I guess it's tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and thousands of suppliers. Yes, yes. It, it's, uh, if you, we move about uh, 26 million containers a year in, in 20 foot equivalent. We move uh, 350,000 tons of air freight. We, we also move things across roads operate a large network of warehouses. So it's about connecting all of these different networks around the supply chain so that it is a seamless infrastructure for our customers. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of break, give us a breakdown of your tech plan? Your, I'm not sure, you know, over the next three to five years, what are the sort of three to five main components? So there is first maybe the unsexy part, which is we're a 120-year-old uh, company. And like all 120-year-old companies, what we have is, is some legacy uh, infrastructure, some legacy applications that all need to be modernized and, uh, and brought up. That's the, the back standard. office software, is it? Or? That, that's, that's some of the stuff in terms of operating system to fully upgrade it and, and, and make it ready for, for what we're trying to do. The, the, the big thing that there is now, like, like everybody else is, there, ha there is an enormously potent industry coming up, and it's AI. Mm. This is going to completely change what we're doing. You mentioned before the number of volumes that we're, that we're missing. It's a really, really high transaction business that is in constant need of optimization. And, and whether it is through IoT or the, applica the application of digital twins, we're starting to really, really leverage incredible uh, synergies or, or, or efficiencies out of the supply chain by, by applying those tools. Yeah, let's t take those two things and look into them in a bit more detail, AI and digital twins. How are you using and how do you plan to use um, AI? So we operate networks, networks of ships, networks of ports, of warehouses, and the connections of these networks and the optimization of the flow is what the supply chain is all about. If you look at the boom that there was during COVID, a lot of it was really caused by 
over ordering for a while and, and the correction that we see now is inventory correction. So what you want is actually to deploy AI in a way to optimize the flow so that you avoid these traffic jams that we've seen and, and all these delays that we have seen during COVID and manage those ah. flows in a much more seamless manner. So the AI can predict customer orders or demand or? So there is some demand sensing. There is also simply some flow management. So how do you keep, it's a bit like your traffic app here. How do you avoid, uh, how do you get to where you want to go without necessarily having to, to run into the traffic jam or go where everybody's going? So there is a lot of that optimization uh, ongoing. There is also, in a business that has largely been relying on experience and manual work, application of how, how do you run a port? How do you manage the flow through the port where actually uh, these optimization algorithms help us do it in a way that people who have been in this industry for a long time would find counterintuitive, but that when you do it, you actually see uh, big cost synergies actually emerge and better service to customers. And, and what about digital twins? Yeah, so the digital twins, it actually allows us to run scenarios and plan for how we're going to manage the operation way better than we have. It means uh, over time for us, significant redu reduction in capex, it means uh, higher efficiencies, higher throughput, higher capacity in, a, in our network. But it means also much more resilience in terms of you know, missed connections, mm. points of failures that get avoided because we're able to deploy these technologies effectively. I don't know if your companies publicly disclose this, but roughly how much are you investing in this big technology project? And what are the, if any, return on investment projections yeah. that you're making? Yeah, so today, <laughs> We don't disclose the, the numbers, but I can tell you, we spend over a billion dollars on, on tech uh, every year. A uh, billion and, every year. Yeah, wow. and we're going to continue to do that uh, for, uh, for the foreseeable future because just the potential of it is, mm. is just enormous. And, and these new technologies, two or three years ago, AI was not really on the agenda the way that it is today. And so these technologies continue to evolve at such a pace that I think the, the opportunity is, is, uh, is enormous. I think for us, what has been really, really the most important part of the journey was to go from a fairly outsourced model where we buy software packages and just look at it as a way to connect or enable certain transactions to really go into an insourced models where a lot of the software we use is actually our code because we see technology as being actually differentiating to what we're going to do for, for customers. So when we talk about applications of digital twins, when we talk about uh, some of the optimization algorithms that we're using, these are actually codes that we develop to solve problems for our customers, but that we see as being differentiating for what we can do. Mm, so it can give you technology, can give you a competitive edge. Roughly how many tech staff do you employ? I guess it's going up each year. Yeah, so we, ha we have about 3,500 software engineers uh, in the company today, which, w which is really up from very few just uh, five or six years ago. And it's about 100,000 employees roughly, is that right? Yeah, so we have about 100,000 employees, 3,500 uh, software engineers. In, in these 100,000 is also a lot of uh, workers, uh, seafarers, uh, blue collar workers in the warehouses and, and so on. If you look at, if you look at uh, office, office based, our footprint is probably around 40,000. Okay, well, that's quite a lot, so get, It's about 10, t about 10,000 of our office-based workforce is actually, uh, is actually software engineers mm. and data scientists. When, when we were talking backstage, you're talking to your comms people, one of them mentioned the fact that here, you, or, you actually work with, with startups. You're almost like a kind of incubator, and you've been, startups have been yeah. pitching you, and maybe you'll get pitched after this. Can you explain a bit about how you work with startups and, and what you look for? Yeah. So for us, there's a lot of stuff that, that we gain from engaging with the ecosystems and, and with the startups. Uh, first of all is to really understand how they're thinking about some of the, the problem solving that they're engaging into and also to figure out who is on to solving a problem in a better way than what we're thinking or in a way that mm. we're not really solving that problem, but that could be really uh, value creating for, for our customers. So, so there is a lot of benefits that we gain from, from engaging in there. S some of it through investments, but actually what we have found is the most, uh, works the best for us, is actually we can lend businesses. So we can lend you know, our data or some customer trials, or we can bring traffic to the platform in order to test 
the solution that the startup is bringing. So, so I, that, that has the, 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 the partnering, the, the, uh, the, the bouncing off ideas and the running things together like to test ideas. Like in a kind of sandbox, you mean, environment? Yeah, or? exactly, exactly. I see. And um, so that's, uh, have you actually launched any products by working with the um, startups or? Yeah, so in the, um, in the e-commerce domain, we've, we've had some uh, different engagements with different startups, and, and some of the uh, modules in our e-commerce solutions are actually powered by startups we have invested in. Mm. Uh, one of them actually uh, we bought a few years ago. So we, we started by investing, and then when we saw where this was going, we actually felt that this could actually be a key component mm. of our, our offering, and we actually bought them out. Mm. Now, one of the big themes of this conference has been AI, of course, but also automation and one of the there's a lot of excitement about these technologies particularly in the tech industry but particularly outside the tech industry there's a lot of concern that automation will mean job losses so what would you say perhaps to your employees someone in a warehouse who thinks hang on Vincent this all sounds great but what does this mean if AI can do my job in five years time or do you think you'll end up with less employees because of AI or perhaps more so Today, for us, one of the key worry that we have is actually to get sufficient workforce to man the warehouses that we have. So automation is exciting for us, not because we can cut people, just because we can alleviate a problem that we have today that we can't get the people that we want. There's a skill shortage, you mean? Yes, it is, yeah, it's, it's a shortage of staff that we have. And I, I've, my, my theory, my hypothesis, is that automation in the warehouse is not driven by the need to cut people, it's driven by the insufficient skills that there is and the need to automate as much of the processes as possible so that you can l deliver a high and consistent service to customers, but also actually right size what you have to the skills. What, what, what that you're parts, to get. what processes are, are, are ripe or ideal for automation in, in the warehouses? So I think there is, there is tremendous uh, progress being made in automation in, uh, in the warehouses, w whether it is uh, inventory checks uh, through drones, whether it is how much of the pick and pack can be done automatically. There's just a lot of things happening uh, in there. The use also of, uh, of digital twins for the warehouse to actually plan your inventory and what SKUs goes where so that you have the least uh, amounts of whatever walked mm yards and miles or whatever, is also something that, that, mm -hmm. that has a, a lot of potential. In the port business, it's a bit similar. But I think also for us on the office-based population, customer service and so on, just the, 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 uh, the use of uh, LLMs and, and AGI in general. Oh, learning has, language models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has, have tremendous potential to actually uh, automate and, and answer uh, questions from customers in a much faster and, more, uh, and better way than what we can do today. No big IT projects go smoothly, I'm sure you know that. So, so what have been the main challenges in this kind of digital transformation so far? What have you learned from or what, are, what hasn't gone as smoothly as you'd hoped? Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, we went from a fairly outsourced model where we were buying software, IT was a cost, it was just something we needed to connect uh, our business and be able to you know, generate accounts and uh, the transactions and so on. The transition from, from going from IT as a cost to IT as a business enabler. Going from an outsourced model to an insourced model, it's not just about getting a few thousand software engineers. It is actually about getting then your leadership to be able to work with those software engineers so that the code you're generating is actually solving the problems you're trying to solve. Do you work with the software engineers in a different way? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you don't buy the package and then you need to have you need to adjust your processes to fit the package. You actually need to have a constant dialogue between your product management and your software and your, your tech engineers and really get to something that works. And a lot of the, a lot of the business people that have been in this 120-year-old company, they're not used to doing that. Mm. They're, just it, it, getting, it, it, they're just rolling out the package. You do some training packages, you roll this out, and then you, you, and then you move on. And you, and you deal with the bugs afterwards. But here you have to invest yourself. So the, the accountability, the responsibility that you take is completely different. It means also that we went from having, I think if I look at our top 100 executive in the company, 10 years ago, one of them was in tech, today 12. Out of how many? Out of 100. Okay. 
So, so it's just the weight of tech in the industry, the voice of tech in the industry, and the need to talk tech for line managers has completely changed. And there you get a lot of, you could say, learning moments, projects that take longer, or what you roll out was a big misunderstanding between product and, and, and engineering, and then what you're seeing, you're rolling out. The code is not really solving the problem you were trying to solve. So it, you need to double back and, and, and have a couple of redos. And do you manage your projects differently? Is it all sounds like, you know, so-called agile working, yeah. where you're, you're doing things in short bursts rather than build everything in? Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's, of course, it's not like an all our code, so it's also about having an architecture that allows you to deploy an accounting software, which is not you know, differentiating to our customers. There you buy a package, but to provide, uh, for instance, uh, interfaces to, to customers and so on. Then you need a lot of the services that you do with respect to visibility and, and so on. That is the code that you write yourself. I guess we've got time for a couple more questions. What about industry challenges? You're trying to transform yourself, but is it hard to agree technical standards um, so that things run smoothly between networks? Yeah, so that's a really good point, because actually our customers will look for a way to integrate data, but under that, for moving the stuff, they will keep on plugging different vendors in there, which means that the necessity to have actually standards whether it is geolocation or, or uh, uh, just uh, data interface, data formats for, for interfaces is, is just extremely important. And that, that is something that is lacking and that we, we're trying to, to, to get established across different players so that we can have uh, data interchanges and APIs that actually are fairly easy to configure. Let's just look to the future. Um, in, if we're here on the stage in five years time or even 10 years time, what technologies do you think we'll be talking about in logistics? Will it still be, will we be talking about a, another version of AI? With AI, will it be quantum computing? Will it be something else, do you think, that's really shifting the industry? Yeah, so what is really mind-blowing when you talk about AI is the fact that you don't talk about adoption in terms of years. You actually talk about adoption in terms of months. You do projects and you say we need to get there within 12 months, 18 months. It, it, it's just a really, really, the, the, the speed of adoption, I think, is going to take us somewhere where it's really hard to see where we will be in five years, just because of the speed at which mm. the change is, is coming and the potential that it has to be deployed in, uh, in that. There's a lot of really critical problems that we've not been able to digitize and crack that AI actually will be able to solve uh, for us. And that's going to completely change the way that, that we work. On the back of this, with all the use cases that we have, is quantum computing going to be the next thing that when, mm. you know, that, that is very, very possible because when you connect these different networks, just the, the amount of compute that you need to solve some of these optimization problems is mind boggling. And that, that is going to probably have some type of solutions that will come. I think for us right now, for the next couple of years, the focus is really, really on, on, uh, on getting AI in front of as many colleagues as possible improve the service quality and, and being able to, to move the, to unlock the potential that it has. Okay, well thanks very much, Vincent. As we're talking about logistics, I think we should uh, finish on time. So um, thanks for your time and uh, thanks to the audience. Enjoy the rest of the conference.